Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we're joined by Mike Sicardi. He's going to share with us some of the charts that are top of mind for him in his own process. We're going to review the overall market environment. The S&P choppy day, finishing barely in the green. Mid caps and small caps right around the zero line as well. But a lot of activity underneath the hood. If you look at the energy sector, up pretty big. Financial sector, up 1.5%. Consumer discretionary, communication services, the growthy stuff dragging on the uh, on the downside ladies and gentlemen this is the final bar Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of technical analysis, using charts, technical indicators, uh, measures of breadth and sentiment, and most importantly, price to better understand market dynamics and investor behavior. You know, overall, this week has been a fascinating one. You know, we've talked about the rotational environment that I think is a great way to describe this market, not just today, but for months and months, right? Much of 2021, it's felt less like a market call and more like a stock picking exercise, trying to identify where the leadership themes are going to emerge. This week, we sort of have a rotation back to the value trade, things like energy uh, doing pretty well after a pretty, you know, fairly decent pullback. You're finding some of those names bouncing off their 50-day moving average, leading to the upside today. The financial sector improving as rates go back above uh, 165 for the 10-year yield. And then on the downside, you have some of the growthy stuff that's been some of the leadership uh, that we've uh, been talking about for quite some time. Now, don't get me wrong, the tech sector is still in pretty good shape from a technical perspective. The XLK down uh, less than a quarter of a percent today, but overall, you're certainly seeing some rotation. I, I would argue it's always an important time to look at relative strength and focus on what's outperforming and what's underperforming using uh, the relative strength uh, analysis, but especially now we're seeing a lot of uh, rotation uh, in the leadership. Uh, we uh, want to get to our guests here uh, very quickly. Just as a reminder, the next couple days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we'll be taking time off for the Thanksgiving holiday. Hope you all have a wonderful holiday. Take time to uh, celebrate with those around you safely. And uh, we'll be back with you on Monday, the 29th. On the 30th, which is that Tuesday, we have Sean McLaughlin uh, from All Star Charts. On Wednesday, December 1st, Tony Dwyer from Canaccord Genuity. Then I'm excited on Thursday, December 2nd to welcome Mark Chaikin from Chaikin Analytics back on the show. So some really solid guests here helping us get through the holiday weekend into December and focus on the uh, the year uh, end of the year period, which always tends to be sort of a, a fascinating ride, but especially now as you've had the markets on such a significant run to the upside up until now. We're going to get to our market recap here in just a moment. To start off, I wanted to uh, mention the poll. We have a poll running on our Stock Charts live stream, our TV live stream page at all times, uh, also through social media. And we recently asked you, how important are seasonal trends in your process? Gave you four choices, a primary input, use them often, but not as important as other things. Use them occasionally, but not very often. Or what, what are you talking about? What are seasonal trends? So very few of you use them as a primary input. Very few of them, few of you ignore them completely. And I think that sounds about right. Most of you in the middle. And if I would say I probably in the, in the occasionally, but not very often bucket, which ended up getting the most responses on here, you know, seasonal trends for some people, cycles and seasonality are incredibly important. And my conversations with uh, Jeff Hirsch, uh, son of Yale Hirsch, who founded the Stock Traders Almanac, uh, does a great job of keeping that publication going every year. You know, he's very focused on cyclicality and seasonal trends and what, you know, points what, what tends to work at different uh, periods on particular dates, uh, you know, around the Thanksgiving holiday, what's tended to happen. You know, for me, I've tended to focus primarily on price and then think of cycles after that. However, there are certain types of parts of the calendar year where it usually is a really good idea to pay attention to the seasonal trends. And I would argue we're sort of in one of those. We've gone out of that seasonally weakest part of the year. We are now in the seasonally strongest part of the year, November and December into January tend to actually pretty, be pretty decent for stocks. And understanding that we're in that environment versus like April, May, June, which tends to be a little weaker, just gives you a sense of the headwinds based on the seasonal trends, uh, the seasonal tendencies really uh, in the market. 
Let's continue on with our market recap. We'll look at the markets today. As I mentioned, the major average is really chopping around, which is, you know, if you ask me, give me the, an example of a day from a holiday weekend, a shortened holiday weekend, I'd probably pick something like this where you have some things up, you have some things down, nets out to sort of a flat environment, but a lot of potential uh, themes and a lot of movements, right? And you have, uh, you have certain stocks and I'm looking down at the big movers today, things like Dollar Tree. We talked about the dollar stores and what the run that they've been at, uh, that they've been on, not just Dollar Tree, but other uh, discount uh, retailers uh, as well. And, and Dollar Tree up about 9% today. A lot of energy stocks coming up with Apache, Occidental, uh, all in the uh, on the top here, Devon Energy, DVN. These are stocks that have pulled back a little bit and now starting to bounce off of that pullback level. A number of them have tested their 50-day moving average. Uh, you know, CVX comes to mind, ConocoPhillips, I think one of those uh, you know, really clearly bouncing off of their 50-day moving average. So worth noting is that the short-term pullback to a 50-day moving average before we have the next leg higher going through a year end? Uh, that's certainly a question I think that's uh, that's worth considering. Elsewhere, we have the VIX pushing uh, further to the upside, not up to 20 yet. It's around 19 and a quarter, but higher than uh, than where we finished yesterday. And the NASDAQ down today. A couple key uh, themes, key movements to pay attention to. The dollar was not one of those. Dollar essentially flat from yesterday, but interest rates continue to push higher. And uh, I'm, I love to ask people what their one chart is, right? If you have one chart to understand the market environment besides the S&P, what would it be? If you ask me that question today, I'd probably say the TNX, dollar sign TNX, a 10-year yield. While there are a lot of charts that are really, really important for sure, uh, I think 10-year yield tells you a lot about the overall uh, leadership characteristics and, and whether growth or value are more likely to perform well given the interest rate environment. We'll look at a chart that I think tells that story really well. Uh, later in the show, but uh, ten-year yields, for the record, up uh, around 167 on the uh, on the ten-year. Gold, silver down today, but pretty much all the other commodities up today, with uh, with a nice rotation higher. Oil prices pushing to the upside, natural gas uh, as well. And the commodities uh, complex as a whole higher, uh, but sort of the uh, the energy side uh, really leading the way higher. And as I mentioned, the XLE was up over three percent today. Nice push higher for the for that sector. Crypto land, it, it seems like most days recently, it's either been bright red or bright green pretty much across the board. It's rare that you're seeing these little movements. Now, that's kind of the nature of the cryptocurrency space. These coins tend to fluctuate a great deal. Ether really pushing uh, to the upside. If you ever look at the ratio, by the way, of Ether versus Bitcoin, you find that it's starting to favor uh, Ethereum here recently. As, uh, as Ether pushing well above 4,000, getting to uh, around 4,370. Bitcoin's still struggling to regain that 60,000 level. Now, again, uh, Bitcoin topped out around 60, got up to around 64, 65, then came way down to the 30s, re, uh, regrouped all the way or retraced all the way, 100% of the way back there, got almost up to 70,000, now back below 60. So it's been quite a ride in 2021. At the end of the day, paying attention to the charts is, uh, is most helpful. We're going to get to the chart of, uh, of Bitcoin here in a, in a moment, but let's continue on looking at a chart of the S&P. So, you know, I was doing an interview earlier today and they asked me to just sort of describe my overall take on things. And it's I love that general sort of starting question. How do you summarize all of the charts that we talk about on the show, all of the themes that I'm you know, reviewing all the time. And you know, the, where I started was just a chart of the S&P. The story of 2001 is, or 2021 is basically almost every month uh, this year, uh, if not every single one, we've, uh, we've uh, gone higher than we were in the previous month, right? We've made new all-time highs every month of 2021. The S&P, the NASDAQ continue to push onward and ever upward. And while I could give you lots of reasons why the market should not go higher or could not go higher or reasons why we're overextended or reasons why certain things are most likely to break down at the end of the day, the price tells you a lot of what you need to know. And besides a September pullback, which ended up being around five and a half to 6%, uh, you know, not a huge uh, sell-off and really below the average pullback that you would get uh, for the S&P during the, the course of the year. That was the most a severe pullback that we've had and overall still not that negative, right? We did a little bit of a, of a breakdown. We broke below the August lows, but overall we've continued this upward trajectory and we're, you know, one day off of new all-time highs as the S&P touched uh, around 47.50 uh, yesterday. So is the market, you know, uh, extended and that it's had an incredible run? Absolutely. Are there reasons why the market could go lower from here? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, I'm much more uh, comfortable defining my risk using the charts. And when people ask me about the overall environment and to describe why the market 
should go higher or lower. I always remind them, look, the market's going to do what it, what it does. At the end of the day, you can create a narrative to help you understand why these different things may happen. But at the end, focus on the charts. For me, there's a real clear uh, line to be focused on. That's around 45.50. That's the high from September. That's the breakout level from October. We pull back and then rotate it higher. That's right about where the 50-day moving average is going to be here for the next uh, the next week or two. And overall, any pullback that remains above that level is still relatively stable, I would argue, from a long-term perspective. You break that, and then you have to start thinking about 4,300, which would be the next pullback level. And from there, you have to define uh, some further lines of support. You know, Getting down to 4,300 from current levels would be the deepest pullback of the of the year for sure uh, and would be uh, would be uh, certainly out of character of the the November to December period which usually tends to be pretty strong however the market can do whatever the market decides to do so i would focus on the charts and again one level at a time 4550 i think is an important one to uh, to watch i want to talk briefly about bitcoin but i don't want to spend too much time because i know my guest uh, mike sicardi one of the charts we want to get to is looking at a bitcoin related chart but you know when i think about it it's it's, it's separating yourself from the flickering ticks the short term to the long term and looking at the long term trajectory i'm seeing bitcoin break below its 50 day moving average for the first time since september uh, which was the last sort of corrective period if you can call it that uh, we had about a 6 week period of uh, of weakening before we rotated it back higher and regained the previous highs. You're seeing a similar sort of, uh, of pattern where you made new swing highs and then you start to come down. You have that bearish momentum divergence, then you rotate lower. In general, I, I, I tend to think of things uh, of the path of least resistance. For me, the path of least resistance appears to be lower as you continue, as you see the bearish divergence, as you see the market, uh, the uh, the chart breaking down through the 50-day moving average, regaining that level, uh, you know, momentum holding above 40. These are things that would tell me that Bitcoin is potentially remaining uh, relatively uh, relatively strong. Final thing I just want to mention is we're talking about the market, market recap. You're seeing a lot of names uh, going higher and in random things, right? Things like Smuckers and, you know, SJM is uh, potentially, I mean, arguably not my favorite chart in the world, but an interesting one. And it's and what, what I like the most about it, it's in a sector that most people, including me, don't tend to uh, like, right? There, it's, it, there's a lot not to like about the staple sector when you look at the overall performance, particularly versus consumer discretionary, but always be open to stocks making higher highs and higher lows. And SJM appears to be doing that. Let's take a quick break. We'll be back with today's guest, Mike Zaccardi. We'll see you in a minute. <music> Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's great to have you join us every weekday after the close as we look at the charts together, try to answer these questions about where the opportunities may lie. A couple of quick comments or quick uh, announcements before we get to today's guest, Mike Zaccardi. First off, we're going to do a mailbag segment a little later in today's show. Those questions all come from you, our viewers. You can get your questions to us one of three ways via email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. On Twitter, just tag us in a comment at final bar SCTV. On our YouTube channel, put a comment below the video that you're watching there on our Stock Charts channel. We'll gather all those questions and hope to answer one of yours in our next mailbag segment, which will be Tuesday of next week. Also, as a reminder, go to stockchartstv.com. That is our on demand platform. It's so well designed. I'm super proud of the uh, of the Stock Charts TV team for how they've taken the content that uh, a lot of our great hosts and guests are creating and putting it in a format, in a method uh, that allows you to uh, to digest them on the go, wherever you're at. You can go to stockchartstv.com, use your email address to set up a free account, start watching all of the uh, content on demand, or just search on any of your mobile devices on the App Store for Stock Charts TV On Demand. I'm going to welcome on today's guest, Mike Zaccardi. Mike is coming to us from Florida as an investment writer, just actually recently joined Stock Charts as a contributor. He's writing for our top advisors corner. Mike, good to have you on the show. Welcome. Thanks, Dave. Great to be here. Great to be part so, of the team. Yeah, it's 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 great. It's been awesome to get to know you, Mike. And you do such a you're so generous on social media, sharing a lot of ideas uh, with uh, with the investment community. Start us with small caps. Now, small caps are an interesting space because it's one of those areas that just was a non-factor, right? It felt like everything else was working and small caps weren't. That's now all started to change in the last six weeks. Has been quite a movement. Break us down uh, this chart for us. What are you seeing? 
Yeah, so this is everyone's favorite or most hated chart of the year, I think, IWM. And this uh, flirtation with the 235 level, you know, we had this huge range dating back to February when we kind of had that peak in market euphoria. And now it's just been the sideways chop up until November. We had a big apparent breakout, of course, when everyone's eyeballs are on the same charts, you know, you tend to sort of get a little skeptical. Is this a real breakout or not? Well, what happens is we see a, a retest of the prior range uh, quite often. And so that's what we're seeing right now. And, you know, you, you can look at today's candlestick right there, and that tells an interesting story. You know, we have a, a long leg doji there. So we opened, traded well lower, and then closed right about where we opened. So a bit of indecision there. And that indecision comes right at this uh, point of polarity on the chart. So I think the next week or two are going to be critical for IWM to see if we can indeed hold this level uh, or not. To me, this chart is looking a bit susceptible. I mean, just take a look. We're clearly below 235. Um, so 5 6% off the highs, this large caps of rally, not a good sign. Uh, you know, it's, it's especially concerning given that value stocks have come back in the last couple of days, but small caps haven't. To me, that's not a good sign for the group as a whole. And you mentioned polarity, which is such a great technical concept where, you know, resistance levels will become support or support will become resistance. And you're absolutely right. It's, a, it's such a great example of that. Your second chart taking us across to, uh, to Europe. How does this relate to what we've been talking about earlier in the show in the, in the U.S.? Yeah, so this is another area that I like to take a look at when I'm doing my market analysis. So, you know, everyone's focused on the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ those big stocks, but I like to see what's going on under the surface. So we've got a yellow flag over in the small cap land. And then here we have international stocks, Europe being one of the bigger pieces of the developed world outside of the US. And I, this just doesn't look good. I mean, here's the European ETF out of Vanguard, a triple top pattern. It, it should have broken out there earlier this month on that third attempt, it didn't. So uh, here's another doji candlestick today where that's coming after a series of declines. So we'll see if it can maybe build off a little bit of down, loss of downward momentum. But you know this clearly has to get above that 70, 71 level to see some strength out of non-US names. Um, so this is something I'll be keeping an eye on. But again, just a big chop fest here in the last several months. It's uh, it's absolutely right, and 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 you're right. So, you know, clearly unable to eclipse uh, resistance level. It's usually not a great sign for for the overall uh, health of the chart. Now we're getting to uh, cryptocurrencies. I mentioned just before the break, you know, Bitcoin overall showing some signs of distribution here. I guess is how we might describe it. Talk us through the BITO. This is the Bitcoin futures ETF recently released. How are you seeing this market? Yeah, so this is the kind of the fun chart that we can take a look at. So the the Bitto ETF debuted last month, which sort of coincided right with Bitcoin's high, which is a, always a fun narrative to tell. And it had a pretty massive drawdown there from uh, November 9th or so up until yesterday and you know, kind of a weak bounce so far today. So we're seeing some relative weakness out of Bitcoin. Like you mentioned earlier, Dave, uh, we have price breaking below that 50 day moving average. And something on your chart of Bitcoin earlier that I think is important is a very flat 200 day moving average, which mm. we haven't seen out of Bitcoin for a while. So, you know, that flat longer term moving average, you know, just nothing usually good happens when we have a flat 200 day. Um, clearly, there's a, a break in the uptrend. And I think the relative strength note that you mentioned uh, regarding Ethereum is important too. So, you know, the chart of, of Ether is looking quite a bit better than Bitcoin. So we'll see how that in, in a market analysis plays out. It's really fun to take a look at the relative movements within the crypto space, just as you would when you're comparing sectors or individual stocks in the S&P. Yeah, and I, I feel like it's still, it's such a new area. And in turn, it's ripe for analysis and arguably technical analysis, right? Which is, which is built on trends and behavior and, uh, and speculation, all of which I feel like we have 
uh, our cup runneth over with those things in the crypto uh, space. We only have about 30 seconds left, Mike, but I'd love to ask you when you're looking at the overall market environment, you know, the S&P just again, making a new all time high yesterday an all time closing high earlier in November. You know, we're not too far off of all time highs for the S&P and the NASDAQ. As you think of this period between now and year end and, and into early next year, where are you seeing opportunities? I mean, where would you be looking opportunistically, um, you know, as you're thinking of the next month or two? Yeah, like you said, you know, that rotation idea that's been playing out all year, I think is just going to continue. And it's, it's a week to week thing um, regarding seasonality, which I think is important. You know, the first uh, 10 days or so of December tend to be a little bit weaker. That back half, back third is pretty strong. So I think we could see a little more choppiness for the next couple of weeks. Well, if we like choppiness, I feel like we have plenty of opportunities to enjoy it in this market. Mike, listen, it's awesome to have you on the show. We'll look forward to having you uh, back on again. But until then, stay safe and be well down there in Florida, okay? All right. Thank you, Dave. You too. That's Mike Zaccardi. Mike's an investment writer. Recently, uh, we asked him to uh, join uh, the Stock Charts contributor uh, crew. He's uh, writing some content for our top advisors corner, really focused on financial advisors. So if that's uh, how you would describe yourself, I'd encourage you to check out some of the stuff he's putting on there. You know, I found from working with a lot of advisors, technical analysis is such a great way of making sense of this market environment and enriching a conversation that you might have with a, uh, with a client. So hopefully his work can help you along, uh, along that way. I like Mike's uh, take overall on, uh, on cryptocurrencies, particularly thinking about those, uh, the, the, uh, the ratios and the uncertainty. Uh, we're looking at the S&P, we're thinking about rotation. You're seeing rotation in stocks, you're seeing rotation in cryptocurrencies as well. A lot, of, uh, a lot of reasons to keep focused on the charts here. Let's continue on today's show with the final bar mailbag. As a reminder, we love to hear your questions. We are here at all times for you. Here's uh, hopefully in our next show, our email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. Uh, send us a question when you have a moment. Let's get to it. First question. I have a question regarding Javed Mirza's charts. The charts show that in the past, we have had a bull cycle followed by another bull cycle. So would we still see all five phases if this were to occur? Um, and I really appreciate you sending this uh, question, by the way. You sent this after we had uh, Javed on the show uh, last week. Javed's a technical analyst at Canaccord Genuity based in uh, Toronto. Did a really good job just talking about the different phases of the market. And I think you were referring to this chart where we're talking about the five phases. And this is sort of the natural cycle of the, uh, of the equity markets here in gray and then the economic cycle in blue. And I think his main point, which hopefully you all heard and digested, a lot of people, I think, you know, uh, incorrectly reverse this. You look at economic conditions and then try to infer what that means for stocks. And you have to remember, it's actually reverse, right? Stocks are probably the best leading indicator for the economy uh, of all so, of all time. So, you know, when you when you look at the market, the market is going to tell you what the economic conditions, how though, you know, what to expect for those going forward. I would think of the cause and effect a little differently if you're uh, if you're accidentally reversing it. But he was talking about some of the leadership themes and looking at things like energy and staples to see. Uh, the moves there and what that would mean. You know, is this, and this is the way I would describe your question or answer your question. This is an idealized cycle. You know, is it, is it normal that we go through all five, five of these phases very systematically? No, it would be so easy if we did. And I've had a lot of debates with Martin Pring about this over the year. He does, he's done great work on the cycles. He actually has a chart where he plots the different asset classes on these ideal cycles and does the same with sectors and industries. And, you know, it's, it's a really fascinating way of thinking about it, but it is certainly an oversimplification of the cyclical nature of the markets. It reminds me a lot of the conversations with Julius de Kempner about the RRG, right? Would it be perfect if everything just normally went through a cycle and just beautifully in a clockwise fashion followed along and went in a circle? Yeah, but that would be way too easy. The markets are not that simple and not that straightforward because it's a complex system with a lot of, potential input. So no, there is no guarantee that we're going to go through all five of these cycles. There is no specific measurement on timing for these. So they could be very quick rotations. Uh, but at the end, it gives you sort of a base case. It gives you a general way of thinking about what the environment is relative to what it could be. And that, that's, I think, uh, what uh, Java was trying to get to with that chart. Next question, I'm seeing a difference between advancers decliners from the Wall Street Journal compared to the predefined scans on stock charts. Why the difference? That's a really good question. Um, so let me bring that up here. Hold on, we're gonna go to, so the way you get to our predefined scans is at the top, there's charts and tools. On the right side, there are a bunch of really cool uh, things you should spend some time if you haven't gone through those, but you're talking about the predefined scan results here. So basically we have a bunch of scans that we run every day and, and during the day as well. These are updated intraday and this gives you the number of stocks that fit these different basic criteria and then goes 
uh, to here. And by the way, if you go to our advanced scan engine, you can take one of these predefined scans as a starting point and then build your own scan using that as a building block. That's a really good way to get started with the advanced scans if you've not done that uh, before. But you're referring, I think, to like this one, right? So you have new 52-week highs and it's saying 161 on the NASDAQ, 124 uh, sorry, 161 in the MYSE, 124 in the NASDAQ, and so forth. And you're comparing this with uh, Wall Street Journal or any other data provider. So, you know, what, what's the answer? So it's tough. And, and the only reason is because, you know, for, you know, for something like stock charts, we have all the control we need over our data and how we're showing it. We can't really speak to what other, other uh, you know, companies, other providers are doing because we, we can't see what they're doing with the data. Um, so I, I can't tell you, but I will tell you in my experience, there's two things that usually cause this. Number one, are you looking at the same universe? Now, I'm guessing because you're looking at the Wall Street Journal and you're probably looking at the New York Stock Exchange would be my guess. These numbers should be very, very close. Uh, and that's probably it. The second thing would be, and it's maybe three things. The second thing would be the time frame, right? So we might be updating the data at different times. So at the end of the day, we'll take a little bit of time after the close, as most people, most firms do to sort of process all the data and make sure it's correct. And then we'll sort of do the official closing process prints once we lock in all that data a little bit after the close. So make sure you're looking at the right timing. Maybe we're updating them at a little different time. The third thing, which I think you might be running into as well, is a, a data. So if you look at the charts that uh, Mike Zicardi brought with them, you see the little underscore between before each of the tickers. That means he's actually unadjusting the data. He's taking the uh, data adjustments out of that, which means in a normal progression of a stock, you're gonna have dividends that cause a change in the value of the stock. So the, the stock company pays out a dividend, the price is adjusted to compensate for that. That's a normal uh, activity in the market. We normally adjust our data, we, we smooth it out and remove those historical uh, adjustments, or we make adjustments for those historical dividend payments so that the chart is more of a pure read on investor behavior. That's what we're trying to, uh, to get to. And your indicators are more reflective of the, of the price action. Because we adjust the data, certain stocks will actually be making a 52-week high on an adjusted version versus an, an unadjusted version. And that's going to cause some of the discrepancies as well. My guess is that's probably what you're running into. But unfortunately, it's hard for us to compare what you're seeing elsewhere only because we, we don't really know what others are doing. We can tell you if you have questions what we are doing and shoot a question to our support desk if you have further questions on that. Boy, we took way too much time with that question, but that's a busy one getting through it. And so our, our mailbag will have to end there. Keep your questions coming though, and we'll hope to answer yours in our next mailbag segment early next week. We need to wrap the show and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is dollar sign TNX, the 10 year yield. As I mentioned, uh, I mentioned a number of times, I, there's one chart I would use besides the S&P to just understand what's happening. Uh, I think you can make a lot of assumptions based on the direction of interest rates, because I, I, I would argue that provides a huge headwind and or tailwind to different sectors and different themes. And you'll find that lines up pretty well. An interesting one, though, is at the bottom here, I'm looking at the relative performance of the financial sector versus the technology sector. In general, if the interest rates are going higher, then the financial sector most likely outperforming a growthy sector like technology. If rates are going down, you'd probably see uh, financials underperform. That makes sense because higher rates and a steeper curve tends to be better for banks, to be, to be honest with you. It's becoming a little bit disconnected, though, in the last couple of months here. You can see that rates have gone higher, but in the last six weeks, you're actually seeing the financial sector underperform technology. And I would argue that's driven by the uh, incredible performance run you've had in the technology sector. Things like semiconductors, Microsoft, Apple, all of those obviously doing very, very well, sort of uh, bucking the trend of the normal relative performance characteristics there. Chart number two is gold. We talked about the weakness in gold yesterday, the gap lower, further pain today as the GLD going uh, below both the 50-day and the 200-day moving average. Another one of those, uh, what's called a long-legged doji that Mike Sicardi pointed out, similar on the chart of the, uh, the GLD today. A lot of times that represents sort of a short-term, uh, you know, turning point, uh, a, a reversal uh, pattern. But you know, I'm I'm very concerned by this island reversal, which is a gap higher, a bunch of little uh, patterns, a bun bunch of price action, and then a gap lower. And overall, that path of least resistance appears lower. The RSI right at 40, though, and that's what I would be looking for on that chart. Finally, I was asked in an interview uh, earlier this week. What would tell me that the market's no longer going higher? And of course, as you would probably assume, my first answer is the chart of the S&P stops going up. But my second answer was defensive sectors, things like utilities, things like consumer staples start to do a lot better than they have been. Now, the XLU is just potentially breaking out, but the relative strength still not doing so. I'd be looking at that relative line at the bottom and see if it would turn higher. That would tell me to get a little more concerned. Folks, that is our show for today and a wrap 
for this shortened holiday week on the final bar. Have a great Thanksgiving holiday. I want to thank Mike Sicardi joining us from Florida on the show today. For StockCharts.com, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great one. We'll see you on Monday. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.